Beauty and the Beast may be one of the most beloved romances of all time, but when Disney chose to feature the tragic but inspiring love of Beauty and the Beast in 1991, they left out some of the more horrifying and dark parts of the true story. What is up, Ewu crew? Today, we are talking about everything that the Disney version of Beauty and the Beast left out and delving deep into the tale's dark, true origin. If you were asked if you thought the story of Beauty and the Beast was real, you would likely say no, but you would be wrong. There are hundreds of different stories of Beauty and the Beast from across the centuries. The timeless tale has been adapted throughout history to different languages and cultures. In each different iteration, the tale changes. Sometimes the beast is a horse, such as in the Danish version, or a bear in the Swiss telling. He has been a snake in the Chinese and Indian story, a dog in the original English account, and a wolf in a French version. The core of the story often remains the same. A beautiful girl falls in love with a beast despite his appearance, and they live happily ever after. But what if that isn't the whole story? Disney cherry-picked pieces of a story written in 1740 for the inspiration of their Beauty and the Beast. The author, Gabrielle Suzanne Barbeau de Villeneuve, wrote a story slightly darker than the tame Disney version. In Villeneuve's tale, Beauty, the original Belle, is given over willingly by her father in exchange for his own life when he is caught picking a rose for her from the beast's garden in a palatial chateau in France. Beauty goes to live with the beast in the chateau happily, wanting to save her father. While there, she is berated daily by the beast, who constantly asks her to marry him, which she refuses. Rather than a benevolent beast who, despite his previous existence as vain and callous, truly has a heart of gold. Villeneuve refers to her beast as the bête, which is translated to mean either beast or lacking intelligence and very stupid. Villeneuve's beast has been cursed by an evil fairy who wanted to ensnare men into falling in love with her. When the beast refused her advances, she cursed him to live as a hideous monster until someone could learn to love him despite his appearances. A slightly different take on the Disney's beast curse, which he earns by being vain and unkind. Despite his beastliness, Beauty develops affection for him. The beast then tells Beauty that she may go home to visit her family, but that she must return to him in two months or he will die. In Villeneuve's tale, Beauty has cruel older sisters, much like the tale of Cinderella. But rather than making her do chores, Beauty is kept away from the beast until the absolute last moment in the hopes that she will be devoured. Compared to the Disney version, many aspects of Villeneuve's account are downright cruel. But all the same, Beauty races back to the chateau where she saves the beast just in time and they fall in love. After Villeneuve's tale followed countless versions of the Beauty and the Beast story each with unique adaptions. Many versions in the 1800s were written as cautionary tales for young women. These stories warned of marrying a handsome gentleman just for his looks, as he may secretly be a beast beneath his wealth and charm. But what Disney didn't know, or willfully chose to ignore, was that Villeneuve had based her own story on true history. If Disney was aware of the real history, they may never have chosen to feature Beauty and the Beast as a tale of love conquering all, including a curse and vengeful villagers, as the real history is a story of tragedy and the darker side of humanity. The true tale, as old as time, began in the 1500s. During this period, there was a high interest in people with something that those in the time referred to as peculiarities. To the people in the 1500s, peculiarities meant people that were interesting, shocking, or strange. 
These people had oddities about them that were often physical in nature and seen as deformities. For us, we now know that they were rather rudely referring to anyone with physical differences. Peculiarities were seen as someone worth gawking at and to be entertained by. And soon, interest grew in seeing people who were physically different. Courts across Europe began collecting people with interesting peculiarities. In some cases, the oddities were rather innocent, such as if people were abnormally tall or short. They would be brought to court to be admired and examined by ogling courtiers. But those with rarer, more interesting differences became hot commodities. People with what were seen as deformities were eagerly tracked down and taken to be displayed in what was essentially a human zoo or a circus at royal courts. Those who were deemed as freaks were taken against their will, stolen from their homes and often forced to live in distant lands. Royalty and commoners alike flocked from all around Europe to have a look at the so-called freaks. Often, these people could gather large crowds, all eager to catch a glimpse of someone they deemed as shocking and frightening. The position as a court peculiarity was utterly dehumanizing, as they weren't actually seen as humans. And so, they were treated more like animals than people. However, it was also an oddly prestigious position. Essentially, those who lived at court were like celebrities and were highly revered. Occasionally, they were treated well, but more often than not, though they were admired, they were still treated poorly. It was in this world that Petrus Gonsalves lived. In 1537, on the tropical and lush Tenerife Canary Islands, Petrus was born. At this time, the area was controlled by Spain. Very early on into Petrus's life, he was noted to be different, and this difference garnered him a lot of attention. Though we don't know exactly when, at a very young age, Petrus was snatched away from his family and home in the Canary Islands and was taken to the court of Margaret of Parma, who was the governor of the Netherlands. It was there that Petrus spent his early childhood. Petrus had been born with a rare peculiarity, one that is still quite uncommon today. His entire body was covered in long and thick hair. He suffered from an extremely rare condition called hypertrichosis, which is more clearly characterized by an abnormal amount of hair growing on any part of the body. In Petrus's case, it affected his entire body, especially his face. Today, only about 50 people in the world are currently known to have the genetic condition to varying degrees and few as severely as Petrus. Hypertrichosis has been nicknamed werewolf syndrome because the appearance is similar to the mythical notoriously hairy werewolf. But despite the seemingly strange physical appearance, those with hypertrichosis only suffer from excessive hair growth and no other symptoms with the condition. The excessive hair growth can be present at birth or develop later on in life. For Petrus, his hair began to grow very soon after he was born, so we can assume he was taken as a peculiarity very young. At the time, he was said to be a real-life wolf boy, and because of this, he was stolen from his family to serve as entertainment at the Dutch court. Some believe that his family had actually abandoned him because of his condition, fearing that it was contagious or meant that he was possessed, evil, or an animal. At the Dutch court, he was forced to live in a cage, often with chains around his ankles, as people feared he was actually feral. It wasn't long though until Petrus moved again, and this time he was given away as a present. In 1547, at the age of 10, Petrus was shipped to live in the French court of King Henry II as a gift for the king's coronation. King Henry had a particular fondness for freaks at his court, who he made serve as jesters, just as Petrus was expected to do. Though King Henry had already been collecting people with peculiarities, 
such as those he called his dwarves. He had never seen anyone like Petrus, nor had many other people. Ten-year-old Petrus was received with fascination and hesitation. As his condition was so rare, people were shocked when they saw him. They believed he was savage and gave him the nicknames the Man of the Woods and the Hairy Man. As young Petrus was probably frightened to death of his new place at the French court, especially after his treatment in his old home at the Dutch court, he refused to speak. Though understandable, this only furthered the French court's belief that he was more animal than human. They tried to speak to him in Spanish, which was the native language of his home in the Canary Islands, but still he refused to talk. Thinking he was some sort of creature rather than a person, King Henry had him taken into the dungeons at court so that he could be examined more closely. The court physician scrutinized and studied him until Petrus finally spoke, whispering that his name was Pedro Gonzalez. After numerous and likely invasive examinations, the French physicians finally concluded that despite his appearance, he was not a wild man, but a human boy. Even with this conclusion, Petrus was still not treated as human. First, King Henry decided to rename him as Petrus Gonsalves, as he believed the name sounded more fitting for his court. And second, he was put on display as a court jester. He was an instant fascination, and curious noblemen and women rushed to gawk at him. There were even more reports that a few noble women actually fainted at the sight of the man of the woods, who they thought would be a feral beast. The French court was well versed in legends of the wild man, a medieval mythical creature who appeared often in art and literature. In fact, Petrus looked very much like this creature as his entire body was covered in hair as well. But where the wild man was seen as the antithesis of civilization, brutish and savage, Petrus was none of those things. But because of this association, Petrus was often kept in a cage where he was tossed raw meat and animal feed between the bars as people waited to watch him eat. Petrus refused. People stood for hours and stared at Petrus, waiting for him to bare his teeth or growl and reveal his savage side. But that day never came. Soon, King Henry took a liking to the quiet and well-mannered boy. He was especially fond of how frightening Petrus looked in contrast to his quiet demeanor. As a sort of science experiment and pet project, King Henry decided to see if the beast could be tamed. Hiring tutors, King Henry decided to give Petrus the same education that any other young nobleman would receive and started by fitting him with proper clothing, that of a gentleman. We can only assume that prior to this, he had likely hardly been given clothing at all, as they believed he was more beastly animal than person. He was also given cooked meals for the first time in his life. Petrus was also taught to speak, read, and write in not just one, but three languages, including Latin, and he was also taught military tactics. In fact, he was given a better education than many other noblemen. All of his tutors and King Henry himself were impressed with Petrus's ability to learn complex subjects, and soon he became a favorite of the kings. Petrus would accompany the king to court not as a jester, but as a nobleman himself. Petrus's social status slowly began to grow, and as more people met him, they realized that this child, now teenager, was not a beast at all, but a kind and intelligent human being. He became popular and well-liked at court, and incredibly famous across Europe during his lifetime. Petrus successfully proved that he didn't fit the stereotype of the wild man. People still came to see him, this time to meet and speak to the man who looked like a beast and acted like a gentleman. Though this sounds like a happy ending, it isn't quite. 
Despite proving to many that he was more than his condition, he was still viewed as something not quite human. Even if he wore the nobleman's clothes, spoke as well as they did, and was more educated than they were, he was still seen by many insensitive people as a beast. As he grew up, one of the things that separated Petrus from the other men at court was that he was never married. This was due to the fact that he was still viewed as a freak, and no woman at court wanted to marry a man, no matter how nice and educated he was, that was seen as a beast as it would immediately bring down her own social station. In 1559, King Henry died of sepsis after he became injured during a jousting tournament. This left his wife, the famous Queen Catherine de' Medici, as regent of France. Part of her mission when she took the throne was to find a wife for Petrus. Queen Catherine was known to play matchmaker for others in the court, and now Petrus was her new object of attention. This may sound like a romantic quest out of the goodness of her heart, but Queen Catherine had dark, ulterior motives. She was curious to see if she could reproduce Petrus's oddity in his children, and if he and his wife would have little beasts. Even though Petrus was largely accepted by everyone who met him, he was still an object of medical inquiry because the 16th century medicine didn't understand why he looked the way he did. Queen Catherine was curious to see if he could pass on his condition and therefore essentially breed her own freaks. The queen started searching for a good wife for Petrus. But while she did this, she actually kept his condition a secret from the girls she interviewed. Though she considered about a dozen different girls, most of them were noble and their families would never allow them to marry someone they still considered to be a beast. Expanding her search, she began to interview girls from a lower social order, looking for someone who was strong and wouldn't be put off by a husband who was a little unconventional and someone who looked a little different, as Petrus did. After a thorough search of the eligible women in France, Queen Catherine decided on a woman who shared her name, a young Lady Catherine. Lady Catherine's parents were servants, and when she agreed to marry the man who the queen had chosen for her, their social station was raised, and they were brought to work at court. Her portrait shows a beautiful young woman wearing a yellow dress similar to the one later worn by Belle in the Disney film. When Lady Catherine agreed to be set up to marry the man of the queen's choice, she likely expected him to be a gentleman, and though that's exactly how Petrus had been raised at court, she was probably taken off guard by her husband's appearance, to say the least. Especially since Queen Catherine didn't tell the young bride about her husband's condition until right before they were married on their wedding day. And by then, it was far too late for Lady Catherine to refuse. It is rumored that, at first, this arranged marriage was very shocking and a bit upsetting for the young Lady Catherine. Yet, very similarly to Beauty and the Beast, Catherine was eventually won over by her beast's personality. Petrus was probably unsurprised by his new wife's reaction, as he had been greeted with apprehension his entire life. But he was known to be kind, gentle, and intelligent. Despite being essentially tricked into marrying a man who wasn't seen as entirely human, Lady Catherine soon found she liked her beast of a husband. A portrait of the married couple shows Lady Catherine's hand on Petrus's shoulder, a gesture that was highly affectionate at the time and would not often be painted unless the couple insisted that they wanted to be shown in love. In the fairy tale of Beauty and the Beast, the story ends right after the wedding but because of Petrus's fame, we know exactly what happened for the rest of his real marriage. They did eventually fall in love and learn to enjoy each other's company. So much so that they ended up having seven children together and were married for a total of 40 years. To Queen Catherine's glee and interest, she had created a wild family. Four of Petrus and Lady Catherine's seven children were also born with hypertrichosis and looked very similar to their father, while the other three did not. Since Petrus's condition was so rare, 
It is quite interesting that so many of them inherited the disorder. One writer stated that each child born with hypertrichosis was one in a billion. However, it is said that one daughter named Madalena later married and also had a child affected by the condition. So perhaps hypertrichosis was more heritable than scholars initially thought. Nonetheless, all of the children were raised as Petrus had been in his better days, with the same education as other noble children and as respected members at the court. Because of their condition, the four children who took after Petrus were famously memorialized in a series of portraits. Sadly for Petrus and Catherine, European courts were still very interested in collecting and displaying freaks for their entertainment, no matter if they were noble-born or not. Madeline, Francesca, Henry, and Antoinette Gonsalves were stolen away from their parents and other siblings and sent as gifts to other royal families to live at their courts, a fate just like Petrus's own. As they weren't seen as completely human, the children were treated as objects that Queen Catherine owned and could do with as she wanted. Petrus must have protested his family being torn apart, but there was nothing he could do. Antoinetta was given away as a gift to a noble family who lived in Bologna, Italy. In this portrait, she holds up a paper detailing her life story and lineage. While living with the new family, she was intensely examined by a doctor named Ulissi Aldrovandi, who took extensive notes about her body, especially her hair. With even more hairy freaks to gawk at, Petrus's family sparked further fascination for people with peculiarities in Europe. Horribly, many courts were no longer satisfied with just staring at the people they thought of as freaks and soon the entertainment twisted into events such as dwarf throwing and acts put on by conjoined twins. As the popularity of these freak shows grew, France actually had its first permanent circus created which exploited these people in the 1700s. Petrus stayed at the French court for just over 40 years since he was first brought there at age 10. However, following an aristocratic coup, Petrus, Lady Catherine, and the remaining three children moved to Parma, Italy, where Petrus was technically owned by Duke Ranuccio Farnese. At this point, the family mostly fades from history, as Petrus is last mentioned in records in 1617, while he attended the christening of his grandson. Petrus is believed to have passed away sometime around 1618, but it isn't known for sure. There are no records of his death or of his burial. This is probably due to the fact that despite all his efforts, he was still viewed as a beast and not human, and therefore not worthy of a Christian burial. Lady Catherine died in 1623. After Lady Catherine's death, their story is mostly forgotten, except for the portraits which immortalized their family forever. It is this rather tragic tale of Petrus and Lady Catherine Gonsalves that inspired the author Gabrielle Suzanne Barbeau de Villeneuve and later the magical Disney Beauty and the Beast tale. Today, there are still a rare few people who have hypertrichosis, and getting a glimpse of their real life condition gives us a better idea of what Petrus may have looked like outside of the still portraits from his time. Larry Gomez, shown here, spoke about his disorder, saying, Not many people in the world have this condition. I believe six to eight in the world, and I am the hairiest one. For me, it means I'm special and famous too, so why not? Similarly, Indian schoolboy Lalit Patidar also currently suffers from the condition, but he doesn't see it quite so positively. He says that school bullies have thrown stones at him and called him a monkey. He has lamented, Sometimes I wish I was like the other children, but I cannot do much about it. He also expressed that he wishes to one day have surgery so that he can better fit in. Sadly, we may think upon hearing Petrus's awful treatment that we would never allow that to happen. When we hear about Petrus's awful treatment as a freak of the courts, 
We might assume that such cruel acts could never happen today. But looking at Patadar's experience, it seems that even now, some people still judge and act unkindly to those who look different. Next time you watch Beauty and the Beast, remember the tragic true life of Petrus Gonsalves, a kind and thoughtful human man who wasn't cursed, but had a condition beyond his control, a person who never wanted to be called a beast.